Thanks everyone for coming. This talk's titled Innovation and the Prosumer Revolution. So my name's Ed. Uh, I joined Magnitude Surveys back in 2017 and up until the start of the year I was uh, the Managing Geophysical Technician. I've just taken on a new role uh, heading up our aerial surveys team. More about that soon. And uh, my email's on there if you have any questions uh, for later on. So we're going to start off the presentation by giving a bit of background about prosumer technology and a little bit of company history about magnitude surveys. Then I'm going to launch into some case studies. We're going to look at two things. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the modular magnetometer systems that we've developed and uh, specifically how CNC machining has helped us kind of make uh, scalable and repeatable systems. And then we're going to look into uh, ground penetrating radar and some uh, interesting work with uh, resin resin composites. So if you've not heard the term prosumer before, it's a portmanteau of producer and consumer. So you not only manufacture something, but you're also the end user. And it's really come about uh, over the last 10 years or so as uh, part of the, the general maker movement promoted by social media, the, the likes of you know Reddit, Etsy, Pinterest and all that. And that's given rise to uh, an increase in the number of hobbyist and desktop platforms. Uh, we have all sorts of different form and cost factors for what used to be quite advanced manufacturing technologies that were, you know, very expensive and difficult to learn. So things like CNC machining, 3D printing, laser cutting, and so on. And so now there's just way more options in terms of price, size, and uh, and there's lots of uh, e-learning around as well to help you help you learn. So a bit of background on the growth of the company at Magnitude Surveys. So uh, the company was founded in 2015 with three founding directors and uh, now we're in 2021 and there's, there's 35 of us. Um, that picture at the bottom, that's, that's about a third of the team. Um, so that means we've got about six field teams now, which uh, has given the need for bespoke but standardized equipment. And uh, just to show you, 35 people does not fit in a team school, sadly. So the first case study we're gonna look at is uh, the development of cart systems and uh, how we've used CNC machining to kind of help us in that. Uh, so when we started out, um, the goal was to, was to stick with uh, GNSS position data to move away from uh, gridding and uh, also to focus on cart mounted collection systems uh, to move from data sets that look like this. This is a, a hand carried survey that I did for my undergraduate dissertation with lots of grid, grid edging artifacts and uh, also quite a bit of uh, uneven stagger moving to more like uh, data sets like this one, which we collected uh, just last week. So in order to achieve this, we needed to kind of make some bespoke cart systems. Uh, in a nutshell, CNC machining, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's a platform with a carriage that can move in the X, the Y and the Z. And you can put different tools in it where we use a router uh, and you can put different tools in that router and uh, control it with a computer, pre-program it to autonomously go and cut whatever shape you like from uh, sheet materials. And of course, first thing you do, stick your logo on. So why would you choose this as a technique? Um, well, if you're manufacturing things and you want to make lots of them and make them uh, precise, they can be more accurate. Uh, you can work precisely. You can make complex shapes and forms. Uh, it's repeatable. So once you've made the design and printed it once, you can print it again and again and again. And it's scalable as well. So, you know, you can choose different size parts, different types of tools, and it, it makes your work just more scalable as well in that you can just repeat things again and again. And when done correctly, it's safer than, than using by hand. Um, you're not in there with the tool. There's no chance that you can get, um, get hurt by it, which is great. So this was the uh, first car system that we, that we developed, uh, the, the hand car Mark I. Uh, and this is it seen from behind to give you kind of a better view, better view of some of the components. Uh, here at the back, you can see some of these plates here, which have been uh, machined on a CNC uh, with the bolt holes in exactly the right place, uh, which makes assembling the system a lot easier and repairing it and replacing parts. And for those of you that are curious and haven't seen any of our sensors, uh, any of our presentations before, we use um, Bartington Grad 13 sensors. Uh, so this was our first adventure into uh, using motorized systems. So this is the our ATV cart Mark I, affectionately named the ATAP, because uh, it's big, grey and heavy. Uh, but you can see there's also the those CNC plates uh, being used again. 
Then at some point, we also took on a Bartington cart system, which was really exciting at the time because it offers a hand mode and a ATV mode, and you can quickly convert between the two. Well, I say quickly, we'll come on to that. So uh, some of the drawbacks we found with it, uh, as, as good a system as it is, um, we found that assembly was, was quite long and complicated at times, especially when converting between hand mode and uh, ATV mode. And also, inevitably, equipment breaks in the field, and ideally you'd want to be able to fix it on site. However, because all the parts were bespoke and not manufactured by ourselves, if you didn't carry the right spares, you could end up being stuck. One time we did uh, quite catastrophically damage that cart system, and so we had to quickly manufacture our own again. Um, so we recycled some parts from the from our big grey heavy cart and started making lighter versions with carbon fibre and recycling bits and pieces. And there's the uh, back view again with some of those CNC manufactured plates. So we slightly refined this design later on to create this slightly more rugged version of the cart, which again used the CNC technology to uh, manufacture uh, leaf spring suspension plates. Then one winter, it got very wet, it got very cold, it got very muddy. Um, so we decided to slightly go away from our, our, our sort of cart, cart based uh, methodology and develop a hand carry system which retained all the advantages of um, GNSS positioning uh, and when 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 walked correctly uh, gave data quality that's pretty much identical to a cart mounted system. It also allowed us to go into areas where previously uh, a cart may not have been allowed to go, uh, areas of higher crop for example. Around this time we had been seeing a massive growth in the archaeological sector in the UK in general um, and also we start to see a rise for ourselves in our, in our workbooks of, of large infrastructure projects uh, which were quite time sensitive and might stretch across many many fields in different states of, of, of crop uh, or different states of management. So we needed to create a system that would cope with all that and the solution was to create a modular system uh, which we affectionately called the dragster which involves a backpack system that you saw before that you can put on a cart which can then be very quickly changed uh, from a hand uh, to carry a system to a quad toad system. I think it takes about five bolts to be removed and replaced for it to, to switch between the two. So here is it. Here it is in hand mode and uh, here it is in quad mode. In this instance, um, because it's also modular, you can actually add on uh, an EM system and, and collect magnetometer and EM data at the same time. Here's a very quick example, none of the actual data, but the uh, just the, the, the red polygons are um, they are magnetometer data and some of the, the archaeological anomalies that we found and the broader the broad yellow and blue polygons are interpreted from the electromagnetics with yellow being areas of low conductivity and blue areas being uh, high conductivity and here we're on a floodplain uh, around the river Trent um, and so you can see there's a nice correlation between the archaeological activity and what would have been sort of uh, sandbanks and sand higher, better draining areas on the floodplain. And then a little bonus uh, about the CNC machine that we uh, that we have, you can also use it to make quite small, intricate things. Uh, and this in this example, we used uh, we used it to manufacture blanking templates to uh, to attach to our custom data loggers and make sure that any ports that we put into it were consistently in the same place and the same size. And the same distance apart and this took down some of our manufacturing processes from um, you know it, it would normally take me maybe half a day to a day to, to drill out all these ports and I did four in half a day with this uh, CNC machining method which is really useful. So I'm going to move on now to uh, case study two which is uh, GPR and composite manufacturing. I'm a bit behind on time so I'm going to try and get through this as quick as I can. Uh, so we purchased a 450 megahertz single channel system, uh, a Marla, Marla Ground Explorer, and, uh, and we've been, we started off using that. Uh, there were times when we wanted more uh, high resolution radar, so we rented the Marla Mira system, which uh, can be seen in use here at uh, Ripon Cathedral, looking for graves. Um, when we were asked uh, to do a large scale GPR survey, we uh, rented the uh, see TriView uh, system, which gives you a nice 1.5 meter swath width and uh, three frequencies um, to work with. So in terms of doing large scale surveys in the future, 
we thought we'd like to stick with a single frequency system but have a wider swath width. So our solution was we, we purchased the uh, Mala Mira system and decided to start taking it apart and uh, spreading it out into a wider array than its normal 3D configuration. To do this, we needed to make a casing for it. Uh, we needed it to be strong, lightweight, rigid, and waterproof. Sound familiar? Because it's a boat. That's what it describes. So we started looking at boat manufacturing technologies to try and figure out how we can make nice lightweight shells. Uh, a traditional method involves making a mold uh, and then putting down some fiber reinforcement, glass fiber, carbon fiber, that sort of thing, pouring resin on and then rolling it and doing this repeatedly in layers. Uh, and it creates, creates a nice little shape. We didn't want to do that. We decided instead to do the slightly more complicated way, uh, which is to create a mold the reinforcement down, seal it all up in a vacuum bag, draw a, draw a vacuum on it to remove all the air, and then open up a tap to bring some resin in. And then the resin flows through to leave a finished part. Why did we want to do this? Well, it, with this method, it takes out all the air, and it means that only the very minimum amount of resin is added to the part. So there's no excess resin and there's no wastage. Uh, it makes the part lighter and stronger. Than, uh, than if you just use a hand method. It also means that you can lay up all of the reinforcement at once, and you can do that with as much time as you need. Um, so you can really do some interesting things. For example, here with our test piece, we put on um, carbon fiber uh, matting around the sides to, to act as shielding. One part of uh, working with resin and composites, it's, it's optional depending on what you're doing, uh, is, to, is to use a curing oven. Uh, however, they don't really make curing ovens the size that we needed. So, we had to build our own uh, using a, a PID and a heater and uh, fireproof boarding. Uh, we then purchased some just a, a standard off the shelf kit of resin and, and tools to kind of experiment with, which we learned a lot of lessons with along the way. Uh, unfortunately, our first attempt uh, at a part, we decided to make a single tray shaped mold, but we couldn't release the final piece from it. So I actually had to, to hack it apart to look at the results, which were actually quite promising in terms of strength and uh, lightweightness. We went through a system of rapid prototyping. I made a small version of, of a piece that we wanted. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the pattern I made broke, but uh, the final result was quite nice. You can see the, the difference between the two molds. Uh, so step one for our final piece was to make a pattern, uh, which we used our CNC machine again to, to, to hack our model into slices, which we cut with the CNC machine, filled with foam, filled again with, uh, with body filler, and then went through a very long cycle of, uh, of painting and sanding to create this nice polished pattern that we built the mold off. Then we create this split mold that goes onto the part in, uh, in stages so that when you finished it, you can release it by taking, taking the mold apart rather than trying to take it all out at once. There's our dry layup again. And there's the other thing, fusion process. And then we tested it. Um, that's the final part there with all the antennas in, which uh, seemed to work quite well indoors. And uh, we also reduced the weight from the original mirror um, box from 25 kilograms down to seven kilograms. And the, uh, the outdoor test was quite good as well in our car park. We could see services and we could see uh, pipe trenches as well with a channel spacing of uh, 20 centimeters and a swath width of one and a half. We also tried to make a high resolution version. However, this time we had a problem can see our signal traitors are starting to, to, to have interference and starting to become attenuated uh, in a very odd way. Found out that our ambitions to put in uh, carbon fiber, we weren't careful enough and uh, a stray piece of carbon ended up uh, on the base, which, which was causing these problems. So in a, in a mesh, it acts as a shield, but as strands, it acts as an antenna. Some short statistics, took 18 months on and off of development. We used up about 350 kilograms of resin-based products. Uh, in our various uh, experiments. Um, and this technique was very different from CNC machining. Uh, it scales very differently. Um, there's a lot more to learn. Um, bigger and more complex builds require different techniques and methods, um, but the practicing and refining on small parts yielded really quick gains. So if you're thinking of getting into this, my advice is start with small projects. You don't need to use as much material. You may not need an oven, and you can use original pieces of patterns rather than making your own. And there's plenty of e-learning out there. Um, so you know, if, you, if you're not sure where to go, there's, there's plenty out there.
So conclusions, the, the rise of this technology has made it more accessible and affordable for us. So we'll go from these big pieces to the little ones, uh, means fewer barriers to making your own. I'll just skip past that because we're at the end. We're also going to start looking at 3D printing because we haven't really uh, haven't really explored that yet. But uh, there are some really nice new new machines out there, and that's that's still advancing very quickly. 